Hello friends, so far we have discussed dispersion modeling techniques like Gaussian dispersion modeling for point source, line source, area source. Now today we would like to discuss about assimilative capacity of an air shed. You might have heard about watershed, okay? so the catchment area and you know we, we look into all kind of uh, variables there like uh, precipitation then runoff etcetera and the carrying capacity of a particular ecosystem like lake or river, how much pollution it can digest within a given time framework. Similarly, the air shed also has the carrying capacity or assimilative capacity that means we can discharge certain amount of air pollutants into it and then it can clean itself. There is some self cleansing capacity you can say because of dispersion, dilution, those natural phenomena which occurs all the time. Okay. And then uh, you know after that it is again uh, clean atmosphere and if it is beyond the assimilative capacity or beyond the carrying capacity then the atmosphere will be polluted, it will have poor air quality. So, first of all we will discuss about what is the air shed, then uh, you know demonstration or explanation of the air shed and assimilative capacity of an air, air shed we will define, then we will see like how to estimate the assimilative capacity of an air shed through techniques of ventilation coefficient or pollution potential, then we will see one example of determining ventilation coefficient of an air shed then we will have a case study so that you can visualize what is the way to estimate the assimilative capacity of an urban air shed or simple air shed and then we will conclude. So, when we talk about the air shed, what is air shed? Air shed is basically you know a geographical unit, it, an area uh, you know within uh, some length, breadth or height you can say topography is also there. So, this is a geographical unit which has common characteristics of air pollution emission sources and wind flow patterns due to certain topographic features or certain meteorological constraints. So, they have uniform kind of or uh, common characteristics of air quality or emission sources and wind patterns like wind uh, velocity, direction and uh, meteorological parameters like uh, humidity or temperature profile all those things. So, within that particular area you will find certain you know plus minus may be there certain variability can be there, but a kind of uniform for example, you can distinguish between a valley. Okay. So, valley area where there are certain ways where uh, you know this air will take the pollution from one place to another, there will be valley effect, there will be you know inversion phenomena, diurnal inversion occurs because of uh, you know changing of the solar insulation during uh, morning time, then uh, you know evening time and then day time. So, so that is the variation which is different than the plains okay, and which is also different than the coastal regions. So, there are certain regions or geographical area which has common characteristics and we call them as an air shed that atmosphere. It will also have watershed, it will also have other things okay, so many uh, several ecosystems, sub ecosystems or larger ones, but it also has air shed. So, we can define within a boundary. And this air shed can be defined as a part of the atmosphere which behaves in a coherent way. As I said, it will have some common characteristics with regard to the dispersion of the pollutants. It will have certain way of dispersion, dilution of the pollutants because of those meteorological factors. It can range from a small area with fewer polluting sources to a large metropolitan agglomeration with complex air quality problems. So, like here you can see this figure which shows the air shed boundary for the this Chesapeake Bay in United States. Okay. So, this is the boundary layer it is shown here. Well, then uh, you know this uh, air shed boundaries can be defined differently for different situations. For example, we can say that an air shed which is uh, limited uh, by geographical region such as a small valley as I just uh, tried to illustrate it or uh, in, in which dispersion of air pollutants is limited by topographic constraints such as surrounding of the hills, water bodies etcetera. Right? Then during stable, stagnant, light wind situations these particular features of the valley effect or lake effect can reduce the dispersion of pollutants which are emitted through local sources for example, there may be some industries or wood stoves like uh, you know we uh, in villages people use. 
uh, wood or cow dung or those kind of biomass for meeting their needs for the energy. And this can lead to the degraded air quality because it does not disperse so quickly as it happens in plain areas. Okay. The next is like air set can also be a large geographical area covering hundreds of square kilometers because of similar type of pollutant emission sources, topography and meteorology. As a result, it experiences similar air quality issues. So, wherever you go, you will find similar kind of emission sources like for example, in a city you will find those uh, vehicular emission sources, industries may be there, domestic sources can be there, but another city can have different kind of sources, they can have different kind of uh, you know air shed. So, that can vary and this air shed this covering large geographical area as we have, we have seen you know this kind of uh, limitation or boundaries can be drawn to represent the air shed okay? and air shed has this you know uh, height within this atmosphere length width etcetera. The boundaries of an air set can also be based on administrative considerations for example, municipal corporation, regional or political borders. So, this can also occur in vast relatively uh, you know level areas with no significant changes in land height like Delhi you can call one air set, okay. you can uh, then call some coastal regions an uh, air set. Okay. Then the methodology for uh, delineating this air shed includes three main steps. First, we have to quantify emissions to prepare a multi pollutant emission inventory. Without emission inventory, it would be difficult to know how many sources, uh, it would be difficult to know how many sources are there and how much amount of pollutants are coming, which kind of pollutants are coming from which source. Then collection of representative meteorological data, we cannot have each and uh, every corner uh, these meteorological towers, but representative means like industrial area, commercial area, then residential areas, educational areas. So, because every area has different characteristics. So, representative meteorological data can be collected within those particular areas and uh, then we have to analyze, we have to evaluate those variations of the local and regional level meteorological parameters. Then we need to predict air quality levels using air quality dispersion modeling tools which we have studied already. So, that can help in understanding the atmospheric uh, transport of pollutants or transformation of pollutants also if you use some chemical transportation model from source to receptor and its dispersion in the steady area. So, you can see this emission inventory, then analysis of meteorological data, collection and analysis, okay? then air quality modeling, all these three aspects are there for uh, you know delineation of air shed related information. Then we come to the assimilative capacity of an air shed. It is also known as carrying capacity. Many authors and researchers use different kind of nomenclature. So, please do not get confused, this is one and the same thing. But of course, we have to see other parameters like pollution potential and those things we will come into shortly. So, the assimilative capacity of an air environment is the maximum amount of pollution load that can be discharged into that atmosphere without violating the best designated use of the air resource in the planning region means that means you can discharge or you can emit lot of pollution until you know it is within the uh, uh, those uh, national air quality standards kind of thing. It, it should not violate, it should not exceed those limits, then assimilative capacity is up to that limit. If it exceeds, then it has crossed the assimilative capacity that is means. The phenomena governing the assimilative capacity of air environment includes like dilution, dispersion and uh, deposition even like uh, dry deposition or wet deposition all those things you know already. Well, then what are the uses of this assimilative capacity? Why do you want to calculate it? Okay? So, we should know about this uh, feature that, is, that this assimilative capacity can be an important tool for suggesting the safe limits of disposal of pollutants for industrial operations or for planning some industrial area as well as for area based management of air pollution and to mitigate the pollution levels. Okay. So, that way if you are planning new city, new industrial area, then assimilative capacity you have to estimate that this much of pollution load can be discharged into the atmosphere. You have you need to know the boundary or background uh, information of the air quality and then you do modeling efforts. We will see uh, you know shortly that how do we calculate so that you can know how much pollution load can be allowed to uh, emit uh, different kind of pollutants. Well, the assimilative capacity in broad terms is an indicator of potential for future growth 
keeping in view the resources such as air, water and land because air pollution also can pollute the water bodies, it can also pollute the land as you know these are the integrated approach of the ecosystem. Well, then there are approaches how to estimate the assimilative capacity. So, the broadly two approaches are there. First approach is based on the ventilation coefficient. What is when ventilation coefficient we will know. So, this assimilative capacity in the atmosphere is directly proportional to the ventilation coefficient which is computed through meteorological parameters like maximum mixing depth or maximum mixing height and the average velocity within that depth or height. Okay, we multiply that. So, that particular thing is known as the ventilation coefficient. Then second approach is through pollution potential or dispersion potential. These are two different opposite meanings you should be careful about. Like assimilative capacity is inversely proportional to the pollution potential and directly proportional to the dispersion potential of the atmosphere. So, it is estimated through dispersion models in terms of resulting ambient air concentration of pollutants due to change in the emission sources only then you would like to estimate is not it. So, you first run the emission uh, dispersion models and then you know how much air quality is there. So, the dispersion potential if it is more of the because of you know wind velocity because of certain topographical features then it will have more assimilative capacity. Pollution potential means if there are more sources if there are more chances of emissions of the air pollutants then it will have the less assimilative capacity. Well, so the ventilation coefficient we want to study, we want to know. So, you can see this is you know this environmental lapse rate, it can be uh, monitored by some uh, way like balloons etcetera or those sodars. Then we need to uh, you know uh, this, uh, we have to have this particular adiabatic lapse rate related profile. So, wherever they intersect up to that you know depth we or height we can call it maximum mixing depth. So, we can calculate it easily, we need to have the actual profile of the environmental lapse rate. So, the way temperature is decreasing or increasing with the height. So, this this one is the actual okay. and this is the adiabatic lapse rate related. So, wherever they intersect that would be the height which is maximum mixing height or maximum mixing depth. And then we have to know the wind speed at different heights up to this height as you know wind speed increases with the height. So, we will have different wind speeds at different heights. So, we need to know the average wind speed within that particular depth or height of the maximum mixing depth right. So, that average speed of the wind is multiplied by this maximum mixing depth right. Then we get the ventilation coefficient. So, the ventilation coefficient basically is an atmospheric con condition which gives an indication. Okay. It is difficult to know how much pollution it can take, but it can really give us some sense that uh, you know the air pollution dispersion, ambient air quality and pollution potential will be more or less something like that. Well, so the higher the coefficient, higher the ventilation coefficient, the more efficiently the atmosphere is able to disperse and dispose the air pollutants and better is the ambient air quality. And low ventilation coefficient, this lead to the poor dispersal of pollutants causing stagnation and poor air quality leading to possible pollution related hazards. Right? So, the mixing height as we have seen, you can have this particular uh, temperature profile then draw the adiabatic lapse rate and intersect it then measure this one. You can know this one also like uh, there is elevated inversion layer. So, below this mixing depth is there because pollution does not cross this inversion layer and there are various uses of this mixing height basically it is used or involved in many predictive and diagnostic methods because modeling uh, techniques need this mixing depth for several calculations. It also need to assess pollutant concentrations in models. So, we use this particular thing atmospheric flow models all these kind of tools use the mixing depth. Well, so methods of determining mixing depth are many or uh, several which you already know we have discussed in uh, lecture number 12. So, those are like radio soundings, okay, subjective method with the experts opinion, objective methods, remote sounding uh, systems. Then it can be determined by parameterization and uh, modeling like neutral conditions for unstable condition or stable conditions. So, there are several ways to determine the maximum mixing height or depth. Well, now how to estimate this ventilation coefficient? So, let us uh, you know go through this very small example for you like in a given situation the ground level air temperature is 15 degree Celsius, okay, it is given while the normal maximum surface temperature for that month is 
26 degrees Celsius because every day we are measuring. So, at certain day it was maximum 26 degrees Celsius. At an elevation of 100 meter at the height of 100 meter and 300 meter the temperature is uh, you know like 17 degrees Celsius and 21 degrees Celsius. Please note temperature is increasing with the height. So, that you should know that this is inversion phenomena otherwise temperature decreases with the height normally when it is increasing then it is inversion. Well, the wind has a velocity of 2 meter per second at 10 meter height that is the ground level we know. Okay. Whenever we say what is the wind velocity at the ground level that means we want to know the wind velocity or speed at the 10 meter height. Okay. The wind exponent is given as 0.3 which is used for uh, determining the wind velocity at certain heights right? because 10 meter it is given at the 10 meter. So, we want to uh, measure at 100 meter, 300 meter then we will use this particular exponent. Okay. Then calculate the maximum mixing depth and ventilation coefficient with these parameters. Okay. So, let us see. So, the environmental lapse rate first of all we need to calculate. So, this can be easily calculated by knowing the difference between the temperature and knowing the difference between the elevation or uh, between the height. So, this is 300 and minus 100 this is the height difference then this is 21 minus 17 is the temperature difference. So, you can see here this is increasing temperature with the height. So, this is the inversion ELR uh, this environmental lapse rate is showing the inversion phenomena. Now, dry diabetic lapse rate we know this is uh, 10 degree Celsius per kilometer decreasing okay, or uh, you know 1 degree per 10 meter or 0 0.01 uh, 1 degree per 100 meter or 0 0.01 degree Celsius per meter. So, this we can draw and it will intersect here. So, this is the maximum mixing depth or maximum mixing height this z you can say. Well, then we want to know what is the height basically. Okay. So, the at that height when these are intersecting up to that only the plume will go okay. up to that air pollution will rise and then it will hang over there. So, that you can calculate easily with this particular relationship because this slope is given and the z is there. So, z will be used in both uh, direct both for both profiles and you will uh, you can shift the z value and you can determine it it is around 366.7 or 367 meter right. So, this is the maximum mixing depth. Well, now we want to know the wind velocity at different heights. So, we know that wind velocity at 10 meter and we know the coefficient that 0.3 right. So, P is known 0.3 we know the Z 10 and uh, the U 10 is known. Now, we want to calculate U at different heights and different heights are like 10, 100, 200, 300 or up to 366.7 which is the maximum mixing depth. So, we have calculated this you know wind speed at several heights and the average of this is to be calculated so that we can multiply it with the maximum mixing depth and the average value is 4.47 meter per second. right? So, multiply it with the maximum mixing depth to estimate the ventilation coefficient. So, multiply and you get around 6, 1639 square meter per second. So, that is the value of the ventilation coefficient. So, it will vary means depending upon the wind velocity and the maximum mixing depth in the winter generally mixing depth is low. So, it is low value of the coefficient uh, this ventilation coefficient and low potential of the dispersion. Now, we come to the case study. So, this case study has been taken from research study or uh, some uh, field work by S K Goyal and uh, C V Chalpati Rao from Neri and this is assessment of atmospheric assimilation potential for industrial development in an urban air uh, environment uh, of the Kochi India. Okay. So, we have uh, taken this is the source reference you can go through we have taken only the few information just to give you an idea. So, the introduction of the case study is that this is based on atmospheric assimilative capacity of a typical uh, urban area which is uh, in a Kochi city this has been determined with respect to the sulphur dioxide <coughs> okay, emission and dispersion of sulphur dioxide we will focus only on that particular pollutant. Then assimilation capacity of the atmosphere has been represented in two ways like uh, ventilation coefficient and then uh, other dispersion potential of the emission loads discharge into the region. So, we will use the dispersion model. Well, the ventilation coefficient as you know it has been computed uh, using meteorological parameters for uh, all seasons like winter, summer, monsoon, post monsoon those kind of for the year 1998 to 99 and it has been represented by January, April, July and October respectively. 
well in second approach the assimilation capacity uh, is estimated through dispersion modeling approach okay in terms of concentration of pollutant ambient air concentrations and the industrial source complex isc uh, isc dispersion model for point source has been used which is of us epa which has been used to predict the spatial and temporal distribution of so2 uh, through dispersion modeling okay then uh, we have to see you know how much data we need to know so there are representative monitoring sites like in industrial area they have 11 monitoring sites and in residential area 3 commercial 6 sensitive areas 3 so total 23 monitoring stations are there where from we have measured means we means those uh, researchers they have measures the surface meteorological data with respect to wind speed, wind direction and the ambient temperatures. These were collected at a height of 10 meter which is like ground level as I said for which a meteorological station was installed at Kochi during November 1998 to October 1999 and the concentration of SO2 in the ambient air was measured using the modified West and Gaik method which is uh, much popular for this SO2 uh, determination. Well, now, you know uh, in, in study they have computed ventilation coefficient for different seasons uh, for different points. We have given only this uh, you know kind of sample uh, representation. So, you can see for summer here has been calculated this mixing height, then ventilation coefficient and wind speed. This is wind speed, this is the ventilation coefficient and this is the mixing height and this is the uh, ventilation coefficient. Okay. So, the multiplication of this mixing height and this uh, wind speed is the basically ventilation coefficient as you know. So, we have uh, means it has been drawn like that. Then the ventilation coefficient uh, you know uh, the comparison was made for different seasons and it was observed that in summer it is the highest this ventilation coefficient which is also uh, you know intuitively you can feel that in summer boundary layer height is more mixing height is more lot of volume is there for dispersion. So, that when also wind flows with higher speeds right of course, it can vary it can vary from place to place as I said because in hilly areas or plain or coastal regions it can be altogether different and the assimilative capacity of the atmosphere is poor during the morning and late evening hours when you know this mixing height becomes lower and it improves during the daytime in summer and winter season when solar insulation is more so mixing height increases. In monsoon and post monsoon the ventilation coefficient values were found to be less and thus low assimilative capacity was estimated in comparison to the summer and winter. So, these kind of you know uh, uh, assessment has been made in terms of ventilation coefficient. Now, we come to the assimilation capacity as permissible emission load which is basically determined by available assimilative capacity uh, you know in the Kochi region in the in the in terms of industries uh, growth scenarios then predictions of the ground level concentrations were made by using dispersion model estimation of the assimilation capacity was made. So, how to you know differentiate between this available assimilation capacity and permissible emission load. So, because you know that permissive permission emission load is calculated by indirectly by available assim assimilation capacity and this as available assimilation capacity is nothing but the permissible standard that is the national air quality standard based concentration and difference between this standard and ambient pollutant concentration which has been background concentration is monitored in actual. So, the difference means if it is low then the ambient air quality standards that means more pollution sources can be there and that will increase further, but it has to be only up to that kind of quantity or amount that permissible standards that is national ambient air quality standards should not get violated. So, that gives the available assimilation capacity and then you know permissible assimilation capacity is basically taken as 75 percent of that available assimilation capacity. So, that is a kind of thumb rule because uh, you know then 25 percent is kept for considerations for future growth otherwise if you know only uh, you know one particular industrial development if they are using the complete uh, capacity then there will not be scope for the future growth. So, only 75 percent of the uh, available assimilation capacity is used as the permissible assimilation capacity and as I said you know like industrial area 24 hour is average concentration of SO2 was measured like 53 in residential area it was 5 commercial area 6 sensitive area 5 okay, 24 hours concentration and the permissible limits 
uh, by n a q s is 120 80 80 30. Okay. So, the difference between these two like 67, 75, 74 or 25 and the 75 percent of this 67 is 50 basically. Okay. So, this has been because we are talking about industrial area uh, you know in terms of whether some more industries can come, some power plants can come, refineries can, can come. So, this value has been taken, this value has been taken because those scientists have considered only this particular industrial development related problem. Well, so the industrial growth scenario you can see this emission rate is estimated by considering the permissible assimilation capacity of 50 microgram per cubic meter this much right. And this is uniformly distributed in the impact zone of 20 by 20 kilometer that is known as the particular uh, air shed you can see. Okay. And the maximum emission rate is estimated for winter like uh, 13,645 kilogram per day and minimum for the monsoon that was 5,625 kg per day. And a worst case scenario is considered when all the emissions are you know vented through a single stack. So, you can see here you know industrial area related and this was the dispersion formula which you know the Gaussian dispersion equation which is used. So, the Q this is the emission rate which we need to determine then there are other parameters which are like uh, stack height and uh, all those parameters you already know. So, the stack height you know like in industrial scenario stack height for existing coachy around 30 meter only right and then refinery type scenario 70 meter up to 70 meter it can grow. And then uh, uh, power plant type 180 meter. Okay. So, three scenarios have been considered by the those researchers and the stack diameter are different for them, exit gas velocity is also different and those velocities have to be used in that formula as you know. Okay. So, the 24 average, 24 hours average maximum ground level concentration of SO2 were predicted or estimated and the permissible SO2 concentrations or emission load has been determined under different industrial scenarios using this ISCS T3 air quality model of EPA and this is the basic you know uh, relationship of the Gaussian dispersion model which has been used and you know all these parameters which are uh, to be used for uh, calculation purpose. Well, so, it was estimated that in winter for existing type of industry characteristics the region 20 by 20 kilometer square can assimilate 1.1 ton per day SO2. Okay. That one scenario industry characteristic of existing means existing scenario no change. If refinery is to be taken then it was estimated that around 21 ton per day can be you know discharged it is allowed more. Why? Why it is so? Because of this you know stack height because when stack height is more than 30 then it has chances of better dispersion or dilution. Then in case of power plant you know 180 ton per day was estimated that it can be allowed because in power plant you can see you know this uh, 180 uh, meter of the uh, uh, stack height is there. So, coincidentally that value is also uh, about that do not get confused about that. But because of that stack height you know lot of uh, emission is allowed to be dispersed in the air because dilution will happen when it will uh, come to the ground level because of this very large stack height. Okay. So, the power plant has a very high permissible emission load because of this very large stack height okay, 180 meter and this is higher than the minimum mixing height in comparison of all seasons. So, there are maximum mag, minimum mixing height. So, the minimum means the worst case scenario. So, beyond that it can easily disperse otherwise it will uh, take time for the disposition of the pollutants. Well, in case studies conclusion we can say that the ventilation coefficient does not give good idea about the amount of emission load. It, ga it gives only the indication kind of that it is uh, better dispersion possibility or lower possibility. It can only provide a broad indication of the dispersion of the pollutants okay, low, medium, high like that, but does not give good quantitative assessment. But dispersion modeling reveals the industrial sources can be accommodated in the region if correctly planned means this gives the real values whether which kind of industries can be planned and how much it can uh, you know allow the assimilative capacity to come through. Then assimilative capacity in terms of the ventilation coefficient is quite poor indicating high pollution potential in all seasons 
okay, and dispersion modeling approach gives better results regarding assimilative or carrying capacity. So, means this uh, this is very interesting study thanks to uh, Goel and his pro, Dr. Goel and his team that uh, you know the variation or the comparison of ventilation coefficient and this uh, pollution dispersion modeling related approach has given clear cut uh, demarcation that dispersion modeling related approach is much better. So, overall conclusion can be uh, you know taken uh, from this list that the common geographical area where pollutants mix uh, you know create similar air quality kind of profiles has common wind flow patterns they are called the air shed as we have seen air shed because the topic is related to assimilative capacity of the air shed or carrying capacity of the air shed. So, we should know what is the air shed. The assimilative capacity of an air shed can be determined by estimating the ventilation coefficient or by the assessment of the ambient air concentration of the pollutants using dispersion modeling approach for different sources in a given region and thereby estimating permissible limits as we have seen uh, in Dr. Goel's study. Assimilative capacity determination through dispersion modeling approach can be an important tool for suggesting the safe limits of emission of pollutants from industrial operations or uh, you know for the sake other operations also like power plants etcetera and other sources as well for the area based management of air pollution and to mitigate the pollution level. So, this is all for today I hope you now get clarity about what is the carrying capacity or assimilative capacity of an air shed right. Now, these are the references for your additional information which you can go through at the free time. So, this is all for today. Thank you for your kind attention. See you in the next lecture. Thanks again.